Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating 50 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Welcome to the Gospel Truth broadcast. Welcome to a very special edition of the Gospel Truth. You are three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Healing is a part of the atonement of Christ. God wants you well. How can you doubt that you'll get it if you've already got it? You're already blessed. Everything that Jesus came to do, the power for it is released through the gospel, the good news, the nearly too good to be true news. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing my teaching verse by verse through the book of Proverbs. And we are now in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 23. It's, this is the beginning of my 11th week of teaching. Now we've broken this teaching up into two week segments and then we insert other teachings in there because this is a very lengthy teaching. But I really, really felt impressed to the Lord to do this and I tell you, I am so blessed. You know, we are so blessed to have God inspire men to write down what His perspective on things are. And God's perspective is really the only one that counts. Today, we see our society, we see terrible things happening. I mean, it, in some ways, it seems like it's come, becoming unraveled. And I am convinced it's because we have forsaken the Word of God. Even lost people in our nation used to have the Word of God impact them more than now. There were people who didn't even have a relationship with the Lord, but they were constantly being influenced by people who did have a relationship with the Lord and who, uh, you know, put this into the public uh, square and people heard about it. But today there is a, a uh, drought of understanding the Word of God. And I believe that this is one reason that the Lord inspired me to do this. Our program can be heard all over the world. There's over half the world's population that could actually have access to this teaching through our television programs and then with website and stuff. It's just amazing. And I believe God led me to get this out here so that people could hear these truths. Uh, God doesn't force people to accept His values, but I believe it's important that we put them out there and make them available to people. Let me again just mention that we have this product. I have a USB that covers over 900 verses in the book of Proverbs, and we have that. We have a book on this. We have CDs and DVDs, and I encourage you to please get them. As I said, we're now in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. And up until this point from about chapter, I think it's either 9 or 10, up through chapter 23, the Proverbs were basically one verse Proverbs that were disconnected, just truths that were spoken, but not necessarily in sequence. From here on, you begin to start seeing some scriptures uh, grouped together. And there's multiple verses that are saying the same thing. So I'll be covering some things as groups instead of just one verse at a time the way I've done in the past. In verse 23, it says, Buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Of course, you can't really buy the truth and you can't sell the truth. What this is just basically is saying is that we need to put a priority on the truth and on wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Again, in our society today, this is not really popular. People are putting the emphasis on things that are not true. They are, I I tell you, I don't watch a lot of television, but when I do watch it, even if you can find a good program, the commercials will kill you. And the way that they advertise things, and it just grates on me. And I tell you, it is ungodly. And sad to say, most Christians are just, have bought into this. They are comfortable with it. It's the way that they were raised. And there are values and things being promoted that are completely contrary to the Word of God. And we have put the emphasis on that. This is saying we ought to do just the opposite. In verses 24 and 25, it says, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. And basically, this is saying the same thing that was said in Proverbs 10, 1, Proverbs 15, 20, Proverbs 23, 15 through 16. And there's been a number of other references in the book of Proverbs just talking about how that when children do what's right, it rejoices and blesses their parents. 
Would to God that children could understand this. You often hear people say things like, I'm not hurting anybody but myself, which is just dumb to the second power. That's dumb, dumb. <laughs> and I mean, every person who loves you gets hurt when they see you going out and doing things and hurting yourself. And um, boy, would to God that children understood this. It's clearly stated here in the book of Proverbs. In verse 26, it says, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. You know, this is Solomon speaking. And when Solomon started with the Lord, he had a very tender heart. When he was given a choice by the Lord to do anything that God would give him anything he wanted, instead of asking for silver or gold or fame or, you know, victory in battle or any of these things he could have asked for, he asked for wisdom so that he could guide God's people. And God gave it to him, and Solomon started out well. And so the things that he's saying right here in the verses following are great instructions. But sad to say, Solomon didn't continue well. It says over in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, that Solomon loved many women. He had 700 wives, 300 concubines. I can't even imagine that. And um, it says that his wives turned his heart away from the Lord, which was a specific instruction that God gave that the king should not multiply him to himself wives because they would turn away their heart from the Lord. And that's exactly what happened. And Solomon actually wound up being an idol worshiper and rebelled towards God. So Solomon would have done well to have followed his own teaching right here. And so he says in verse 27 and verse 28, they go together. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for prey, and increaseth the transgressors among men. Again, these two verses are grouped together, and this is just saying that a whore, uh, a prostitute, a woman like that, you know, even a prostitute get some financial gain out of it, but there's a lot of women that will just prostitute themselves for nothing, adulterous affairs. And again, I know that what I'm saying is not culturally correct today. There are many people that would speak down against anybody speaking against any type of lifestyle that you are judging that you shouldn't be doing this. The scripture right here is saying that this is wrong. Now, this doesn't mean that God doesn't love these people and that God can reach out to them. And under the new covenant in Acts chapter 13, I believe it's verse 39, somewhere around there, it says we can be forgiven and delivered from everything from which you could not be forgiven and delivered of in the old covenant. So I believe in the New Testament that God reaches out to everybody. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And this is just saying that, that adultery and... Um, prostitution, all of these illicit sexual relationships are wrong. And it says that a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman, strange woman here is talking about any type of an adulterous affair, any woman that's not your wife, not the one that you're married to, is a narrow pit. You know, a deep ditch, you can fall in there and hurt yourself. If you're in a narrow pit, the thing can cave in on you. This is just talking about it's dangerous. And it also shows that they lie in wait as for prey. You know, there's other Proverbs here that says the adulteress will seek for the precious life. This is not something that just happens in the heat of the moment. It is deliberate. It's planned. It's evil. It's inspired of the devil. And we need to be saying today that extramarital relationships are wrong. They're sin. It is not godly. And it's like being in a deep ditch. If you don't want to fall in a ditch, if you don't want to be in a narrow pit and have the thing collapse on you, well, then you ought to stay married to the one that you're married to and you ought to stay faithful to them. In the next few verses, these are all grouped together and it's all speaking against wine. And of course here, uh, wine today is not the only beverage that we have. We have hard liquor and other kinds of things like this, but it's basically just talking against any kind of intoxicating drink. So here's what it says, Proverbs 23, 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? And in these verses, I'll go ahead and read the, read the other verses in a minute. 
But it's the answer to all of this is that it's those who tarry long at the wine and seek mixed wine and strong drink. And notice some of the things that it says. You know, who has woe? Who wants woe? Is there anybody that just gets up in the morning and says, man, I want to have a bad day? Who hath sorrow? Is there anybody who just seeks sorrow, that this is the way that you want to live? Who hath contentions? You know, it says that contention is the beginning of strife, Proverbs 17, 14. Who hath babbling? Babbling here is just talking about incoherent statements. You aren't making sense. You know, all of us go to great lengths trying to, to be uh, intellectual, smart with the things we say. We want to per be perceived that way. But who is it that just babbles and doesn't make sense with what they say? The answer is all of these things. The answer to all of these things is that it's people who uh, love strong drink. And the next phrase, it says, who hath wounds without cause? You know, I think this is so great. Wounds without cause. You know, you live in a fallen world. You're going to go through things. There's going to be people that come against you. Things happen, and I don't know that you can avoid every single negative thing that goes on. But people who drink and get drunk, this is just totally senseless. There is no reason for it. There is no reason for any of this. It's all self-inflicted. Why would you do something that brings these kind of things into your life? You know, I'm aware that I'm the, uh, you know, the anomaly. I remember one time being on jury duty, and it was on a drunk driving case, and they were asking all of the potential jurors, you know, have you ever drunk, have you ever gotten drunk, and all of this. And so they went around, when they got to me, they said, have you ever uh, taken a drink? And I said, no. And this lawyer looked at me and he says, now, Mr. Womack, you're under oath. Have you ever taken a drink of beer or anything? And I said, no. And the, the um, judge stepped in and he says, now, you are under oath. You've got to tell the truth. Have you ever tasted beer, liquor, any of these kind of things? And I said, no. And they all just couldn't believe it. And finally, this judge looked at me and he says, did you realize that you're the only one uh, on this jury. You're the only one in this courtroom. You're the only one in this town. You're probably the only one in this county that has never done this. And I said, well, it's true. And anyway, they just dismissed me because they said, you know, you aren't going to be sympathetic to the person that was being tried for drunk driving. But uh, I have not done this, but uh, I just praise God that the Lord has preserved me from this because I see what it's done to other people. Drunk driving, how many people are killed by drunk drivers? And you know, they will sit there and say, but I was drunk, I didn't know what I was doing. Well, you were the one who made the choice to drink in the first place and put yourself in that position. I guarantee you, whatever you do while you're drunk, whether it is just saying babbling here and embarrassing yourself, whether you make a fool of yourself, Whatever the consequences are, you're the one who chose to drink, and you are absolutely 100% responsible for anything you do while under that influence, whether it's having a wreck, whether it's killing another person, regardless of what it is. I'm telling you, if people would look at it this way, I don't know what the advantage is. This is something that you don't have to do. Back in the Bible days, they had problem with water, and Paul told Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities. And so the fermentation process will purify that drink. And so you could, in a sense, justify it back then. But what is the justification for it today? People just like to do it. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that never taking a drink, that everybody has to be a teetotaler, but I am saying that you should never get drunk. You should never get tipsy. And if you do, it was just totally unnecessary. You don't have to do this. Why do it? Let me go on and read the rest of these verses. The answer to this question, verse 29, about who has all of these problems, verse 30 says, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like an adder, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. 
They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Boy, these are some strong verses. Let me go back and look in verse 31. It says, don't look upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth this color in the cup. You know, I've, again, never done these things, but I've seen people at these wine testing things, how they will look at it and then they'll swirl it around and smell it and do all of this. And they just take all of this delight in this. It says, why are you doing this stuff? What is so special about it? I know that there's people that think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. Why do something that's going to bring you all of this sorrow? In verse 32, it says, At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Would you just sit there and play with a, a snake and let that thing eventually bite you and possibly kill you? You know, there are people who handle snakes. And they even build up an immunity to it. They can be bitten and it doesn't bother them. There are some people that handle snakes in a way that they can avoid being bitten. In India, I saw people who charmed snakes and did things like that. You can do these things, but you know, the average person would not play with a snake. The average person wouldn't do these kind of things because of the potential damage that could be done. Well, it's comparing wine and strong drink to the exact same thing. Yes, you can drink wine with a meal and not get drunk. And Jesus did that and the disciples did that. I'm not saying that you can't ever have a glass of something, but I am saying you're toying with something that taken in excess can cause problems. And I don't know anybody who drinks a little wine that hasn't at some time or another drank a lot of wine and gotten into trouble. And why? Man, I just don't play with snakes because of the potential damage. I guess I could. I pr could probably master it. But why even do this? Same thing with wine. And it says in verse 33, Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Again, strange women is talking about a woman who's not your wife. It will lead to adultery. You lose control of your senses. Did you know anything that uh, intoxicates you or numbs you or gets you to where you aren't thinking correctly? Your mind is something that you program like a computer. The spirit is the real life-giving part of us. It's the heart of where the issues come from. But we program our mind and we set boundaries and standards. And our mind is like a filter that keeps us from just saying anything we think. It also keeps all of the junk that's out here from just entering into our heart and defiling us. And when you get intoxicated, you are numbing yourself to that and you lose this control and you are going to say and do things that you wouldn't do at any other time. And it's just foolish. Man, I have no desire to ever get to where my mind isn't working properly and functioning and helping me to serve the Lord. Goes on to say, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Now think about this. This is a word picture. If you try and just lay on top of the sea, on water, you're going to sink. You don't just absolutely float. Now you can get to where you float, but it takes effort. But this is talking about you just lay down in the midst of the sea, and unless you're doing something to float, you are going to sink. Or if you lay upon the top of a mast, can you imagine trying to go to sleep laying on top of a flagpole? I guarantee you, you're going to fall. Likewise, people who are flirting with a strong drink are going to be destroyed. You're going to have problems. Sooner or later, you're going to make an absolute fool out of yourself and pray to God that you aren't driving when it happens, that you aren't doing something else, that you aren't around one of these strange women that the scripture has talked about who seeks out the precious life. And so you make yourself susceptible to that. And then it says in verse 35, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me and I felt it not. In other words, you get numb to all kinds of things that are going on around you when you're intoxicated. And then when you wake up, you're going to do it all over again. Boy, this just defies logic. These are things that happen, wounds without cause. I'm telling you, you would be better off to avoid all of this drink. Again, I am not saying, you know, I go over to Europe and in Europe I've been out with pastors and it's just typical that they drink wine with their meals. 
and stuff. And I don't condemn anybody for that. I'm not against it. But personally, boy, these scriptures speak to me that why even play with something like a snake? Yes, you can handle a snake without getting bit if you know what you're doing, but I just avoid them. <laughs> and that way I can guarantee you I'm not going to be bitten if I avoid it. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 1, it says, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. And so, uh, anyway, there's already a lot of scriptures that we've already dealt with on this. Proverbs 23, 17, and many other places. Over in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Come out from among them, be ye separate, what, uh, you know, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, etc. that he that's a companion of fools uh, is going to smart for it, but a person who is wise uh, and is companion of people who are wise, it'll help them. This is something that's repeated all the way through the scriptures, and we just don't need to envy evil men or desire to be with them. And again, in our society, this is not the way it is. Most of the people, not all, but most of the people who are revered today as these great athletes, as the movie stars, as the people who are put on the magazine covers and things like this are people who are evil people. Now again, God loves them. And I'm praying that they'll turn to the Lord. But I'm saying that their persona, the way that they live, the values that they project are evil. And yet you will find many Christians that envy these people and wish that they could be with them. Oh, they wish they could know some of these movie stars and stuff. The scripture says we shouldn't be envious of them. And you know what will stop that? Is if you understand that regardless of how many shows they're on, regardless how many magazine covers they get put on, someday they're going to stand before the Lord and they're going to give an answer for every single thing they did, every single thing that they thought, Everything that they have done will be exposed in front of God and every human being who has ever lived on this planet. And people are going to be shamed. People are going to be embarrassed when they see that God's standard was the correct standard and how they snubbed it and how that they led people in the wrong direction. And I guarantee you, when you look at things in the light of eternity and see all of this, you will value things differently. Boy, this is important. In Proverbs uh, 24, 3 and 4, it says, Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. And this isn't just physically talking about a brick and mortar house. This is talking about your life, your family, your, you know, everything. It's just talking about that the way you prosper and become established is through wisdom and understanding it's the key to riches, and on and on and on we could go. I'm out of time today, but praise God, we're going to continue this on my program tomorrow. Let me mention again that I have a little digital version of my comments on over 900 verses in the book of Proverbs, and then we have a book on this. We also have CDs and DVDs, and I really believe that this teaching could make a huge difference in your life. You've heard things just today that most people don't hear. We need to be listening to what God's Word says. So listen to our announcer and then please call or write today. We trust you're growing in wisdom as you study along with Andrew through the book of Proverbs. You can get the entire series that covers all 31 chapters of Proverbs in a CD or DVD album for a gift of any amount when you contact us. If you'd like to enhance your study, make sure to get a copy of Andrew's brand new hardcover book on Proverbs that includes all of his personal study notes and commentary on hundreds of verses. This book is available for a gift of any amount. If you'd like to receive all of Andrew's available resources on Proverbs, make sure to order the Proverbs package. This package includes the entire Proverbs teaching in both CD and DVD albums, the brand new hardcover book, and the Proverbs software on a USB drive for your Windows computer. This special USB drive contains the Proverbs portion from the Living Commentary with all of Andrew's personal study notes on the entire book of Proverbs in digital form. You can get this valuable package for just $199. Contact us to order the Proverbs package today. 
The 13th audio teaching in today's series is available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this 13th CD free of charge. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download many free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111 use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. She started um, deteriorating, she started losing weight um, and her hair was getting brittle and her her skin started going like translucent and she she lost energy. We'd had all kind of tests done at the local hospital. They referred us to a a specialist children's hospital in London. And they tried several different um, extreme methods Um, The last one was that they went to the the tube directly into her stomach um, to feed her. And in my heart I got to the point where if the Lord wants her to die um, for his glory, then so be it. And that's how how messed up I was in my my thinking, if you like. We got hold of a a, a free tape from Andrew Womack Ministries. And when we listened to that tape, it was like all these truths just came flooding out. And it's like that one tape just opened the whole world up to us. I went home and went on the internet and download lots and lots of teaching and God Wants You Well series, all free from Andrew's website. And um, I looked on his schedule and it had one conference in the UK. It said the 16th of March. The conference was the next day. My faith at the time was, if only I could get um, Andrew to pray for her. So um, we drove up to uh, to Walsall where the uh, the conference was. It was a really humble setting in a little room at the back. It wasn't a big show, it wasn't up front. And Andrew and Jamie came in. It was like a 30 second prayer. He just laid his hands on her and he just spoke to her body and told it to be healed in Jesus' name. And then shortly after that, Hannah woke up. I said to her, you know, when you were asleep, Jesus healed you. And she just, this grin came across her face. And she's like, oh, good. She goes, now I can eat. We, we bought some chicken and she sat there, took bites of the chicken, swallowed it, took more bites, swallowed it. We was all just looking at her in amazement, thinking, wow, she's never swallowed food like this before ever. When we went back to the hospital to have the tube taken out. The doctor looked at Hannah, looked at these test results and just physically stepped back and looked at her and she said, you're perfect. As you heard, Ashley and Carly wouldn't have been able to get that teaching if it hadn't been for that free tape and then all of the materials free on the website. I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't become a partner, to consider it. There's many more people that need the touch of the Lord. As the completion of Phase 2 nears, plans are underway for a power-packed weekend to celebrate this historic event. Special guests Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis will join Andrew and Jamie for this milestone accomplishment. Seating for these events will be limited, so you need to visit our website today to register and to buy tickets for the world premiere of David, the musical. Go to awmi.net slash dedication for more information. We'll see you there.